Hi everyone and welcome back to the Scrumcast podcast episode 3 presented by JS Coaching. Tonight I am joined by uh, one of Peterborough Rugby's Volunteer Clubman of the Year. Um, a real character around the club, has many, many roles including uh, instigating and forming one of probably the area's largest and most successful uh, girls' rugby sections. Uh, Simon Potter is online. Simon, can you hear me loud and clear? Indeed, yes. It, it, I don't know if I can say good evening, because people might be listening to this in the morning, which could really throw out their body clock and confuse beyond the point of redemption. <laughs> so, uh, Simon is... Uh, are you the, the lead of the girls' section? Would that be your title? It's girls' section team manager? don't believe in titles. Uh, if there has to be one, I get called team manager. And that's for all the teams that are under 18, 15, 13 and 11. Oh, under 11s. There we go. So uh, over the past uh, couple of years, I've been working very closely with Simon. I started working with him about eight years ago. Uh, I know, it's been a long time, hasn't it? <laughs> when, when I first started my kind of coaching journey alongside Little Scrummers. Uh, since then, uh, I'm happy to say that I've continued a good friendship with Simon. Um, and also, he's been kind of that that coaching role model, uh, in a sense, and has taught me uh, numerous tricks along the way and how to, how to really kickstart my coaching journey. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have you on tonight, Simon. Um, <laughs> Thank you for your kind words. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, so we're gonna get we're gonna get cracking. Um, Simon has got a really long, well, I can't really say long because that makes sound old. Simon's got a really enriched history uh, around um, sports and also coaching. Um, so Simon, why don't you give us a little bit of background about where you first started in the sports industry, um, and then kind of how you got into the coaching aspect of it. It was about eighteen thirty-seven, I think, I first got involved in sport. <laughs> Um, I'd have been about eight, I suppose, at the time, and <laughs> my parents, well, mainly my mother, encouraged me to play tennis, and I played tennis to quite a high level, uh, county level. I was in the county squad as a junior, but <laughs> never actually played for the county team. I was kind of always the next reserve down, uh, but I, I met some great people, um, and then went on when I was at university, trained to be a tennis coach myself. Uh, that was my first coaching qualification. I was about 19, I suppose, 20 at the time. Uh, took up field hockey when I was at university as well. Won full club colours for that, which was uh, a, a real honour. Um, later went on to play ice hockey for reasons I really can't remember, um, but too boring to explain. Um, and would have been an ice hockey coach as well, had I not broken my ankle a week before the exam, which had a lot of practical in it. So I, I couldn't actually take it. But I'd done all the theory section of the coaching course uh, and passed yeah. those. It was just a physical section I couldn't take part in. On the grounds I was in hospital with my ankle above my head. So I never actually became an ice hockey coach, uh, although I did all the, um, all the preparation for it. Um, I kind of then drifted out of sport after I broke my ankle. I was just become a father for the first time when that happened. Um, but when my daughter was five, would have been, yeah. I was working on Sundays and my wife was taking her to the local rugby club, Peterborough Rugby Club, uh, in the under sixes group. And one week, the coaching coordinator, who used to drink in the pub where my wife was working at the time, said, look, ever so sorry, but your daughter can't go anymore because the, the coach is moving out of the area or he's being kidnapped by space aliens or, or something like that. <laughs> and so my wife, knowing I wasn't there to defend me, kindly said, oh, don't worry. So I'm going to look after the under six group. And that's how it started. I, I said to the club, look, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. I, I've, I've watched rugby for years. I love rugby, but I've never set foot on a rugby pitch. And they said, oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. We only need you to look after them for a week or two while we find someone who knows what they're doing. Uh, obviously, with no intention whatsoever of finding someone who knew what they were doing. Because <laughs> um, all they thought was, oh, thank goodness we've got some sucker to do it. And so I took over the under sixes, which became the under sevens, became the under eights, became the under nines, became the under tens with a squad of about 50. 
Um, we had about six volunteer coaches. It was enormous by this point. Uh, under 11 year, my daughter was happily playing away. We had about 45 players in what would sometimes be three teams turning out on a Sunday. Two other girls as well. And the future had never crossed my mind whatsoever. But all of a sudden, the RFU, in its infinite wisdom, made an announcement mid-season. It would have been January, I think, December, January, right. saying, ah, girls at the moment can play up to and including under 12s, but we're going to change that next season. It'll be under 11s will be their last season of playing side boys in mixed rugby. And that gave my daughter and the two others in the team at the same time, effectively about two months notice that that was going to be it. That was being their rugby career over because there wasn't a, a girls team for 50 miles uh, to where we were based at the time. So foolishly, I said, well, let's set up a girls team then. <laughs> and that came into play the following season. The very first match we played was um, a touch rugby game because the only club we could find wouldn't play contact rugby. And we won that and got quite excited. I borrowed a couple of players from another club for that, just to make up numbers. And oh, then wow. we only had like five. <laughs> and within a year, um, we'd attracted girls in the same position. Their local clubs didn't have a girls team. So I went out and said, look, I've seen your daughter playing against us as a boys team for several years. You've got nowhere to play now. Come and join us. and We'll make a team. And that first season we played, we did okay. Um, but the second season, we went 64 matches out of 64 unbeaten. I think it was 64 victories out of 64 as well, which was absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some other fantastic coaches have come on board by this point. I can't claim the credit. Um, I can claim the credit for inventing the team in the first place, um, but <laughs> not, not coaching the 64 wins out of 64, I think that was. It was awesome i mean we weren't I mean, don't call social services we weren't making the girls play that amount of matches like two, two a week yeah. um we did a lot of festivals and tournaments which are typically six matches in a day and that's how it got to 64 quite quickly but it was absolutely brilliant and we've gone from strength to strength so there it's just an under 13 team at the time obviously as those girls have grown older it's become an under-15 team as well and an under-18 team. Now we've got a feeder under-11 squad as well. And it, the success has just kept on coming. It's been absolutely brilliant. We were honoured to be finalists in the um, Rugby Awards at Twickenham a couple of years back, which was awesome. Uh, the under-15 teams reached the regional final a couple of years running and I lost to the same team twice, both by, I think it was a single point, which was really frustrating, but it's been fun. And if it's not fun, you're wasting your time. The, the, the players, and this is boys rugby as well as girls, if they're not enjoying it, you're doing something really badly wrong. And that, that's got to be the key thing. The success is just the cherry on top of the cake. It, it's got to be enjoyable. And the girls have had such fun along the way. We do a lot. Well, not at the moment because we're all locked in prison cells. But normally we do a lot of things away from the rugby pitch as well, socially with the players, which helps team bonding. And it's just been an incredible journey. Where we go next? I don't know. <laughs> um, now we're coming out of lockdown. We've really got to knuckle down and think where we head in this exciting adventure. So you say you started off with was it five players back in the back in well, the day? Three effectively. <laughs> three, okay. We had three. I did a, a come and try it session. Um, four girls turned up, three stuck at it, which took the numbers up to six. Yeah. And the best thing was the three who, who came to that come and try it session are all still playing. Uh, one of them is off at Hartbury College now. Yeah. Um, the girl done good. Um, the other two are still playing with, within our own club, they're younger. And from that, we started attracting the girls from other local clubs who didn't have a girls team of their own, um, 20 mile radius around. And, and that's how we started the team. So, okay, we started with three players. How many are we sitting on now? Across all of the squads, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Do you know how many players? No. Are... Um, <laughs> it's, it's not quite a hundred. 
Uh, it's, I think it's more than 90 at the moment. Um, but obviously at the time of recording this, which That's might... not a massive achievement, I must say. <laughs> it's not bad. It's, it's not bad. Um, at the time of recording, we're still in lockdown and we're yet to see whether we've lost any or many um, during the fact we've hardly been able to play all season. From the indications of what people are saying, they're all coming back bar one, which is unbelievable. That's um, really Still looking to hear from half a dozen or so, but yeah, we've got somewhere in the region of 90 girls playing in five years after we first set the thing up. And I mean, that in itself, you know, five years, yes, to some people, five years is going to be a long time. Um, to others, you know, it probably it probably shoots by. So to get from kind of three players to now sitting just above 90 in five years is an incredible achievement. And I know that um, across those five years, there's been a number of... Uh, number of trophies and uh, shields uh, won, um, as we like to have that little bit of banter in the clubhouse, that your trophy cabinets are getting a little bit too full. Um, well, and I know you mean you... It, we've got more than the entire boys section put together, you mean? <laughs> yeah, well, let's not go into that on this. Um, <laughs> it's not about trophies, it's about no, the players having fun. 100%. And like, like you said, you know, if there's, no, if there's no enjoyment to it, then there's no point doing it. And um, obviously that's one of the big things that kind of, you know, when I've spoken to coaches and, you know, doing development sessions with them, that's one of the first questions I ask is why you do coaching. Um, and if they don't say for the players or for the enjoyment factor, you know, they turn around and say, oh, well, you know, I want to be, you know, the next England coach, which is an amazing achievement in itself. Don't get me wrong. And it's very good to aspire to. But you need to start at that kind of grassroots, that kind of, the, you know, the starting point that everyone comes to. So being able to to hear from you that, you know, you got into it, you know, just on the off chance that the guys, um, at the club needed a coach um and then you carry on doing it for the enjoyment factor of it not just because you know you're going out winning you know going 100 games on the trot without without losing i think was the record if i'm not wrong um, um i'm not sure did, did we achieve that i that, can't what remember say, whether it was just a <laughs> fluke comment or not i'm not sure but you know, we'll stay with 64 then but obviously then going for that was just one season i think we might have done that I, I, I can't remember to be honest <laughs> but no, I, I, I have absolutely no aspirations to be the next England coach whatsoever. Um, in fact, I don't even coach anymore. Well, I do. I do a little bit. Um, I don't coach. Yes, I do actually coach some of the girls. Um, but no, I, I really gave up coaching as much as I could to just concentrate on building and managing and running the thing. Uh, we do a big girls festival, probably one of the two or one of the three biggest festivals in the country. Yeah. And that that's a feather in the cap, really. Uh, a lot of clubs would balk at the idea of having more than four teams at the same place at the same time. Uh, but our festival, our girls' festivals, have been running for three years, four years. Yeah. And clubs come from all over the country for it. Um, this coming season, we've got Sandal up in the Manchester area coming. Eton Manor from South London came and saw and conquered a couple of years back and they keep coming back because they enjoy it so much um yeah Telford I think have expressed an interest this year as well and that's not a short journey no no and it's like um you know from from my role within within the coach development side obviously at Peterborough Rugby Club and you know trying to you know grow the players and help develop the players you know seeing your festivals and obviously helping out on quite a few of them and you know getting to getting to coach some of the girls sessions um, I know there is a lovely uh, a bit of artwork that you created um, involving, I think, a magic trick and some ballerina activities. Um, uh, you look very good in those pictures. <laughs> um, whilst coaching a session. But, you know, that's one side that I think a lot of coaches, that especially over the coming season, I'm going to try and encourage because obviously um, we've launched um, with yourself on board our coach mentoring programme at the club. Um and you know we we were discussing last night the principles of attack with one of our with a senior uh, women's um, coach at AD, um, and I think it's one of the things that you know everyone needs to experience because the coaching difference between coaching boys and coaching girls is in the technical aspects the same, in Could the be. delivery and the approach is slightly different from what I've seen as a personal kind of observation. You. It, it opened my eyes the first time I came to one of your girls coaching sessions and I watched from the sidelines and I got involved because, you know, to me, I've always coached boys rugby from the age of when I started coaching at the under 10s age group at 
however old I was, 15 or something like that, to, you know, now heading up the, the boys' side of the section, the academy. Um, and the the difference for me that I see between the boys' side and the girls' side is is quite quite amazing because, you know, when you picture, you know, if we look at kind of, we're going to tread on the area now, if you look on kind of the stereotypical aspect uh, of rugby, it is a very kind of male-dominated sport. But when I came down there, and I saw, you know, I think it was three age groups training. There was probably 60 plus players out there. And, you know, they weren't afraid to get on the floor to get muddy. They weren't afraid to, you know, flip people upside down in tackles and, you know, smash people out of the way in rucks. And it was a really eye-opening experience. And, you know, the coaching and stuff that you've got down there are a true credit to the section. And Why did it open your eyes, though? Because I think I came from it from a very, you know, I played rugby. Um, I came from it from a very male orientated aspect you know the club that I first started at the, the other Peterborough team as they are um was all was all male rugby I grew up and you know I'd never really until I came to Peterborough and as in the coaching role that I did I never really experienced women's rugby in a sense I'd never seen it kind of advertised on tv because it's only a very I think it's a relatively new sport as it is um, yeah it, it only really started in the 1880s <laughs> <laughs> No, but you know, for for me as a for me as a developing coach, you know, I was very solely focused on, you know, I want to try and be the best coach I can be, and you know, I'd always coached in male squads. I'd never, I never dare try and tread over to the to the women's or the girls section of it. Um, and then you know, we were given the opportunity to come down and watch and and have a, a coach alongside um, Paddy, um, and really you know, understand the the coaching aspect from that side of it. And it was a really eye-opening experience to see, you know, A, how much they were enjoying it and how much they wanted to get involved. You know, there wasn't a lot of people kind of shying out of it. And it was really, I don't know, it was just a really eye-opening experience for me, obviously. Yeah. You know, I suppose like, that there is one big difference in a lot of boys get taken to rugby clubs by their parents because their parents want them to play. Not yeah. because they want to play themselves. Yeah. And the, the rights and wrongs of that are another conversation for another four hour session. But with the girls, they're there because they want to play themselves. And I think that's what I think that's what it is. You know, I, I, I understand where you're coming from that, you know, some players and we I spoke about it when I spoke to um, Andy and Holly um, in the last episode. You know, it is very much, uh, you know, some peer. Obviously, we coach together at Little Scrimmers or. Uh, we did until recently. Um, and, you know, you get the the odd children that turn up that are really engaged, they really want to get on because they want to be there. Um, and you get the other children that turn up because dad wants them to be the next England player. And don't get me wrong, uh, in the, the years that we've been coaching uh, at Little Scrummers together, we've seen some very talented players. Um, yeah. But you, you also get that at under 11, under 12 age groups as well. There are kids who really don't want to be there. And yeah, it's, it's just wrong that they are. They're, they're turning out in freezing cold, pouring rain. And <clears throat> they, if they don't want to be there, let them do something else. 100%. And, and I think that's what, that's, what, um, that's what really gives the girls' section its atmosphere, is that, you know, you've got 90 girls that are aspiring to be in the next, you know, England squad they want to play county level rugby you know we've got really good succession rates for players going on to kind of East Midlands and even Centre of Excellence with RFU and you know we see that in the girls section because they're determined to do it and they're there because they want to be there you know we've... It, it, it's also a, a certain aspect of proving that they can do what the boys do oh and yeah that's a, that's a big thing but the, there's a different element as well that comes into play here is the camaraderie amongst the players. The, the team spirit, from my experience of, I, I did six, seven years of boys' teams, predominantly boys' teams with a couple of girls, and then moved on to the girls. The, the team spirit is just completely different. They, they just bond so much closer than the boys do. Uh, there's, there's a, yeah, you, you get occasional cliques like you do in any section of society. It, 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 it tends to be that they bond so much better and for whatever reason. It might just be the players we've got bonded particularly well. It might be a girl thing. Uh, you just can't put your finger on what it is. But I've, I've noticed that the teamwork, the spirit 
amongst them is different. It's a different atmosphere from the boys. Yeah, and 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 I, I you know I can I can repeat that because you know from obviously the academy aspects of it, we do see a lot of kind of um, kind of divides in players. You know, you've got your, your forwards and your backs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, in a sense, it is. You've got your forwards and your backs, but even then, you know, because we're now what we three squads effectively from under 15s to under 18s you get yes you get your forwards and your backs and it's nice to see that you know the forwards from the the 16 year olds will go and mix with the forwards from the 18s mm. but even then they're still kind of split and divided because it's that within the male academy there is that high level of testosterone and yep. the yep. male academy is a lot more competitive it's players trying to prove that they are the best that they're trying to assert that kind of dominance and I think at times that's where we've had major kind of blowouts of training obviously we've got quite a few members of coaching staff and we've got some of them coaching staff that come from military background who you know was um, and we've got other uh, now members of the and reassert this well. So it is a very kind of hence well to you kind of can see a comparison for a girl day, you know. Yeah, we, we don't have that um testosterone laden I'm gonna prove I'm the there best are... nearly so much. I mean obviously everybody wants to be better than they currently are. Yeah. Um, that's just one of those natural things about sport. It, it, it's what you strive for. Um, but yeah, we don't get that. I'm king of the castle here and you're not getting a look in. And if you do it only last two minutes and then it's, it's all gone. And, and, that, and that's what, that's what I was, you know, that's what I was kind of coming to. That is the major difference because hey, the girls teams do, want, you know, when someone's, or try the better to them to cause cries probably two or three everyone else is in a drink or dim. Um, you know, there is a lot tighter knit. There is like you say they're trying to that they can stand up to it, you know, they can do you know, they probably can't do or that you know the boys are saying, no, oh, we can do this. But they are group it is amazing that as a club last year, this ninety plus year program um felt the english way is a little joke um that is able to you know produce these next level rugby players i mean how many people have we sent to east midlands over the past five years from the girls section so Ooh, i think it's a bit more than what 20, we've done from the boys 25 girls and how many have got to center of excellence uh we have three called up two stuck at it yeah. One unfortunately didn't make the grade, and that's, yeah. that's I, think, I, I think that's what cuts them apart because it is that determination aspect. You know, I can't think of. I mean, you probably proved me wrong from back in the day, but I can't think of anyone from the boys section that's gone to a centre of excellence. Um, compared to you know, we've had three go from the girls section because of that determination aspect of it. Because you know, they're they're trying to they're trying to prove themselves, as it were. Yeah, but the other aspect you've got to bring into play here is um, w with the boys, there's 10 other rugby clubs within 20 miles mm -hmm. and the pool of players is therefore diluted. We don't have a, another girls team for 40 miles around, 30 miles around. And so the, the, the talent is concentrated on our club. Yeah. And that if we said the amount of players we've trained who've gone on to represent East Midlands that's a lot less than players who started their rugby at other clubs and then joined us because they didn't have a girls team at their own club so yeah you've got that element of um, homegrown talent where do you draw the line is it players that are playing for our club or, or players who started out for the very first time at our club yeah. different question yeah so just coming on to obviously we're we're very I think the closest club to us that's probably got a girls section is Cambridge. Am I correct? Um, Kettering Cambridge. Kettering Cambridge. Okay, so not sure which one's closer to be honest. <laughs> Whereas with the... boys, you've got you've got 
Elmdor, you've got Stanford, you've got Deeping, you've got Bourne, you've got Huntington, you've got St. Neots, you've got St. Ives, yeah. uh, Rushton. Yeah, yeah. Plenty of them. Oakham. I like it how you didn't mention the Lions. That was quite interesting. Um, <laughs> what's, the, what's the furthest club you've been to as a girls' section? Just for an example. What's the longest? Well, we went on tour in Cornwall. Um, no. <laughs> do you mean for a day trip? As, as in for a game? Um, probably Wasps Ground, or Wasps Old Ground in London. We went oh, there okay. for a festival. Um, Middlesex. Uh, north, we would go as far as Mansfield, which is quite a trek. So they are quite far spread then. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the sacrifices you have to make if you're going to be involved with girls' rugby. You're not going to play local matches in the same way that the boys do. Uh, you have to be prepared to travel. And as you get to a higher level, you need to travel that bit further to seek out reasonable opposition. Yeah. Um, there, there are clubs we could travel to that are an hour away that would be no good for either team to play each other. So we have to go an hour and a half away, two hours away. We have to go to the likes of Welling Garden City. We have to go to the likes of um, Mansfield. We have to go to the uh, Sandal is the one we've been wanting to play for years. It's just never actually come off. Yeah. And at long last, they're going to come to our festival this year. So we'll be able to play them for the first time. And that, oh no, I, I bet tell a lie. We did play them at Loughborough. Um, rugby ready, ready for rugby rules. Yep. Yeah. In November, we did actually play them, and this is under 18s and drew, but that's a different sport altogether. Um, effectively, touch rugby, but yeah, we did actually play them and draw with them, and it'd be great to actually play them in rugby, rugby, uh, when our season comes around. Yeah, so you know, let's we're going to go into a bit of a, a future planning kind of thought now. You know, I know you that you know. You are always looking for that that next big thing. You know, you always want to try and push what your girls section does, much like myself with the the, the boys academy, and obviously progress your players as far as possible. What's the what's the plan for coming out of out of lockdown? Obviously, we are probably a week away now from returning to rugby. That's um, exciting, isn't it? <laughs> I know, I know. So, what is what is the girls' plan? Obviously, we've got some uh, projects and other things happening at the club that we probably can't say on a podcast. Um, so what is, the, what is the plan for girls rugby? In my mind, we've got to build from scratch all over again. Okay, we've got the players in, but a lot of players there. Um, to all intents and purposes, we've not played a game for over a, a year. Okay, there's been one or two, um, and not rugby rules as we know and love them. But the girls haven't played for a year. Uh, the added difficulty with girls rugby is the age groups don't follow the boys with, with the boys you have a under 10 under 11 under 12 under 13 and you, your players stick together right from toddler age yeah. up to yeah. vets effectively yeah. but with the girls you've got the under 13 group which is made up of under 13s and what the boys would call under 12s and then the next step is under 15s so half your team move up leaving the other half behind and have to get used to playing with a different set of teammates. And then you've got the leap from under 15s up to under 18s, where you've got three age groups, under 18, under 17, under 16, all playing together. And some of those won't have played together before or even possibly know the other players' names <laughs> um, because we do have a quite a tight-knit group. A lot of the players do know each other. But you, you, you've got to rebuild that team from scratch effectively because you've got 10 of your players have left and 10 of your players have stayed behind and you've got a new 10 in and you suddenly think well hang on i had five props last season now i've only got one and vice versa it, 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 it's a complete change around yeah and that's a difficult thing to get your head around as a coach which you don't have with with the boys game because the boys okay you might lose one and gain one as you go from one season to the next but you've pretty much got the same basic squad together and you know who's there and you know what they're capable of doing yeah. and they all know each other and they know what each other's capable of doing but when you've got a, a team you lose half your players and gain a, another half every year 
And by the time you get back in sync with where you were two years earlier, obviously faces have changed and abilities have changed. People do develop as at different rates. It's difficult. And so, and as much as anything else, we've got to build from scratch, I think, as we go back into, uh, the, we've got two months of, a month of training, month of matches, and then we all pack up again for the summer. So when it comes around to September, it's going to be an awful long time since we were a regular playing and training group of people. Yeah. So yeah. it's very much back to square one, I think. So I think just, just two things on that. Obviously, it's interesting to hear the difference within the age group setups. Um, is, there, is there room to produce a more uh, like a traditional style age grade uh, age group, so it go 12, 13, 14, or is that just what's dictated to you by... It's what's dictated by the RFU. Um, <laughs> obviously, from the way rugby politics works, the Welsh RFU have different age groups. Uh, I'm sure every other nation does as well, just to be different. Um, I don't think there's enough players. It, so you certainly can play 15 aside at each different age group. I mean, we, we could at some age groups, but you've got to have other teams to play against. And there are not that many other clubs blessed with the numbers that we've got. Some, some clubs have more than we've got. Uh, I'm not making out that we're the biggest in the world. You go to Mansfield, and was it last season or this season, whichever it was, they had 30 under 11s, and they don't actually have under 11 teams. They, oh, they're just right. training them ready yeah. for when they become under 13s. And that's a, I don't know how they recruited that many or how they recruited that many of that standard. But yeah, they've done remarkably well there. And it's something we can only aspire to. Um, but one day, one day we'll get there. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, from, as I say, in, in five years, you've gone from three players to 90. Obviously, you know, we've worked very closely together. We have that kind of good friendship uh, out of rugby. Um, along with many of the other coaches from Little Scrummers, um, from the, obviously the Peter Presenter and all those kind of uh, things. But obviously you do push the kind of, you do do very well on the advertising aspect for the girls' section. Like I said, I took a real step back from coaching, partly yeah. because I, I, it's just not me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can coach the younger ones. I'm fine with that. But when it gets into the 15-man game or the 15-player game, um, I've not played it. So who am I to be able to coach it? It's, it's, that's why I've taken a step back. As much as you need to keep pushing for recruitment, recruitment really is a full-time occupation. Yeah. And you, you've got to have the time to devote for that. And stepping away from the playing side, A, it's better for the players. <laughs> um, we do have fantastic coaches, um, and I, I'm just not one of them. Um, but... I do have, I like to think, the ability to organise and I have a media background away from sport and that helps. And yeah, recruitment is a very key thing. And those clubs who who are going to thrive and have thrived and are thriving, it's because they work so hard recruiting players. But players don't just come along. You, you can't just say, oh, we've got a girls team and expect 50 people to turn up. It's just not going to happen. Um, you have to work really hard at it all the time. And that involves every time our own club plays another under-11 club, going to watch them to see if they've got any girls who we can encourage to come and join us when they can't play mixed rugby anymore. I think that is, you know, over the years that, you know, we've been coaching together or... Or working together you know we've always had that kind of that you know anytime a, a girl turns up to to little scrummers you're always giving them a link <laughs> to sign up but it is but that that is oh, i'll sign the sisters up as well you you've <laughs> seen me do that haven't you yeah but that's what i mean that is i think that's what puts the in a sense thinking of it from a club perspective and thinking it from within my roles within the club that's what sets apart the girls section to the boys section because you know the boys section is always done on a traditional basis um 
So, you know, Peterborough Rugby Club has been around for nearly 100 years. You know, everyone knows about Peterborough Rugby Club. If you want to play rugby, you know there's always going to be a squad there. So it's that kind of traditional basis that, you know, oh, you know you're know, you 11 years old or Peterborough Rugby Club will have a team, we'll take them down. Whereas the girls' section, you really had to kind of scream and shout about it to get it out there. And, you know, I think you've done, uh, you know, an astonishing job um, every time we... Thank you for saying so. Any time we go to a different um, sports centre to coach with little scrummers, there's always a, a stack of leaflets. Or, you know, when I'm travelling around the schools as part of the day job, there's always a poster somewhere for, for Peter Girls Rugby. So it is really in your face. And obviously with your media background as well, and, you know, being able to to put stuff together for the press and to be able to, to get adverts out there, you know, you have done an astonishing job on really marketing it. And I think it's something that the rest of the club and the boys section can learn from. Obviously, we have our own conversations uh, outside of rugby, in a sense, um, where I'm picking up knowledge and understanding how to, to better market the academy um, to gain recruitment for them. Yes, we've got three squads. Yes, we're etching towards 75 players and 15 coaching staff. But there's always room to develop because we're going to lose players. Players are going to move to different clubs. Players are going to focus on colleges now because they can play elite level rugby. You know there is a big kind of opportunity there to rebrand and remarket what we're doing. Um, and I think that, you know, from a club perspective, we need to take that from the girls section because it's been the most successful marketing strategy that's ever gone through that club probably. So, you know, it is. I've, it, I've never thought of it in those terms at all. The, the, the only way I've looked at it in the past and still do is it's survival. Uh, if, you, if you don't constantly bang on the, the drum to recruit new players you, you you disappear you fold and having set this thing up the last thing i want to see is for it to disappear so it's got to be that continual slog of um yeah we, we've got to attract players in you, you hit the nail on the head when you say peter for rugby club's been around 100 years and everyone knows if a boy wants to play rugby the club's there yeah with, with girls it's different um We've, we've attracted players from um, athletics. We've attracted players, one player from, am I allowed to use the F word on? No. Okay, I won't say football. Um, <laughs> we've attracted girls from cricket who just are naturally sporty, never actually understood or really got to grips with the fact that rugby is an availability. and. Yeah. Some interesting, uh, there's a lot of debate around the women's game about how many women actually play in the, in the world. And a lot of people don't believe these statistics put out by World Rugby. Um, but if you look at, or, or indeed the RFU for that matter, um, more so World Rugby because they tend to class girls who only play touch at school as being yeah. active rugby players. And that's a dubious grey area. <laughs> but there was a point, I can't remember when, two years ago, three years ago, 42%, I think, of our playing membership at Peterborough Rugby Club were female. Yes. That's a huge percentage. It is. It is. It's an absolutely massive percentage. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> obviously with the senior women's team as well. But that was an absolutely huge percentage. And um, it, it just shows that maybe perhaps women's rugby isn't the, the niche thing that a lot of people think it is. No, and I think, you know, just as you, if you've been talking, then thinking to a conversation I had yesterday, um, obviously on our on our coach mentoring evening, we had uh, Hugh and uh, Aidy, who are the the lead coaches for our senior women's, and you know they're in their twenty fifth year of rugby at the club. Twenty five years yeah. ago, yeah. the senior women's team was formed. You know, and that's that's an astonishing thought when you think that, you know, to me, I wouldn't have said it was been going twenty five years, and I've been at the club for seven eight if not more um it's just it's just a bit of an unreal an unreal thought it's, it's always kind of gone along in the background as it were you know male rugby has always been the kind of dominant sport and i think now the the rise of the female game is starting to to break through and you know it's great to watch the six nation the women's six nations on the tv and you know be really i think the women's rugby world cup is coming up soon so well, yeah. it would be, but they've knocked it on the head because of COVID. Oh. Uh, it's been put back here. Uh, yesterday, well, 
at the time you're listening to this, dear listener, it wouldn't be yesterday, but at the time of recording this, yesterday, <laughs> sorry, we'll edit this bit later. Um, <laughs> yesterday, World Rugby announced they were putting uh, was it 6.8 million pounds into a new um, series, uh, well, uh, I can't remember what they called it, WXV, they called it, which is, I think, 16 nations across the world playing each other in a kind of format well, in every year except that. World Cup year. Yeah, I think I saw that. And World Rugby have said on many occasions that the biggest growth area that they're concentrating on is women's rugby. Whether that's right for the sport as a whole is another debate for another day. Uh, but they are putting money into it, which is good. Uh, at the same time, the RFU seems to be pulling money out of um, what well, we've seen what's happened to the men's championship in recent years. Yeah. And um, money has gone out of the women's game as well. But yeah, it's, it's there. It's a thing. It, it's why people still have this conception that it, it's a minority thing. I, I really don't know when you've got clubs with 40% of their playing membership yeah. are female. It is odd that this perception still exists. But again, I think I think the perception side of it is you're more, what's the wording, the more kind of traditional, you know. Um, yeah, and, and ITV stick the Six Nations game on prime time Saturday afternoon, and you have to go to BT Plus Seven or some obscure channel <laughs> um, or a Facebook feed to yeah. watch a women's match. Yeah. And I, I get that, that the men's game, I'm not trying to pretend the women's game is the same as the men's it's not it's it's more like watching sevens really yeah if you watch six nations women's games or world cup women's games you think hang on that that's very reminiscent of men's sevens the style they play it yeah. you don't have the the massive great 45 stone props banging into each other all game long with, with necks wider than the rest of their body and that's just out you just don't have that in, in women's <laughs> rugby. The ball handling, I think, is the equal of the men's game at elite level. I'll stick my neck out and be shot down over this one. But some of the ball handling you see would look equally at home in, in the men's premiership. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%. And I, I fully agree. But I think, again, that comes back to that. That, um, you know, they're trying to they're trying to prove themselves, you know. And in, in some cases, you know, when I've been down watching watching one of the girls teams play and then I've gone on in the afternoon to watch, you know, one of the academy games or gone down on a Sunday morning to watch, you know, some of the juniors, the handling of the girls section that we've got at the club, again, is equal, if not better, than some of our male squads. There's and no it, reason why it shouldn't be. Exactly, 100%. And, you know, it's that kind of, I think, you know, as a club, we've done it really well. You know, we've had a massive success with it. And now it's now a point of let's grow it and let's expose more people across the area, across the schools and how we do it to, you know, grow that game even further. Yeah, it's a snowball. Um, success breeds success. Yeah. Uh, because everyone thinks, well, the last generation were that good. So it's up to us to be that good as well. Yeah. And as long as they're having fun doing it, <laughs> what's to argue with that? No, and I think that's the key. I think that is the key. Right, I've got two more questions for you, Simon. I won't keep you too much longer. Question number one is, uh, what's the best way to word this? What is your plan as team manager or coach for the coming two, three, four, five years? Where, where do you aim to be within five years' time? Are you still going to be at the club leading the girls' section? Are you going to move on to a bigger and better idea? What's your kind of vision? I'm not going to move on to a bigger and better idea, no. Um, I'd like to think I'll still be there, but who, who can tell? Five years is a long time. Uh, I don't know. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going anywhere, or if I do, it will be in conjunction with what I'm doing at the moment. Um, careless talk costs lives and all that. Um, but no, no, no. Peter Rugby Club has been really good to me. I've made some really good friends there. And I've had a very enjoyable, however many years it is. And I, I've got no reason to want to leave, especially with the exciting plans that are all top secret <laughs> that, that are being talked about around the club at the moment. 
uh, the only way is up. And I, I don't want to turn my back on it just on the beginning of a new chapter. But then every new season is a new chapter. And there's going to have to come a time when I do say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm 98 now. I can't carry on. Leave it to someone younger. Or it might be 76 or 69 or <laughs> 62. Right. I, don't, I don't know. I've, I've got no plans to, to go anywhere. Well, you know, you do currently hold the record for being one of the oldest coaches at the club. The, um, the, oh, no, I'm not the oldest. No, I'm second oldest. OK, the second oldest. But, you know, you are and still an active coach at times, so you are the oldest coach. Well, I'm, I'm still coaching the under-11 girls. And, <laughs> and I, I still coach the really little ones with little scrummers as well. Um, but that's because it's fun. Yeah, and I think I think that's the key thing, you know. And like when I spoke last week to, to Andy and Holly, I think the biggest thing to for me getting out of that conversation was, you know, that really gave it an open insight into what their vision is. And obviously we work very closely with little scrummers. Um and now obviously we've come into this new kind of ownership, this new breath of life, um, as we spoke about the other week, um, with these new ideas that are coming out and you know, I think that it's all it's all onwards and upwards. And I think, you know, you do a fantastic job with the with the girls section, obviously. The uh, future's so bright, we've got to wear shades. That's it. That's it. <laughs> right, I've got one more question for you. And it's one that I asked Andy and Holly. And it's one that I'm going to ask everyone that comes on the uh, the podcast. That's very kind. I'll, I'll have a, a pint of IPA. Thank you for asking. <laughs> okay, so it's a it's a Friday evening. Um, Mrs. Potter is saying, right, let's have a takeaway. What is your takeaway of choice and what is your order? <laughs> takeaway of choice, uh, pizza. It's got to be pizza. Can't go wrong with pizza. What kind of pizza are you ordering, Simon? Oh, vegetarian, you know me. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen you eat a vegetable since we started coaching together about eight years ago. Well, it's not the sort of thing you do in the middle of a coaching session, whip out a carrot and start <laughs> moving on it, is it? I've never seen you eat a well actually I yeah, <laughs> yeah okay won't go there I'll, I'll remember to bring a carrot next time you're in the same vicinity well or a cauliflower I'll just whip a cauliflower out of my pocket and start gnawing on it <laughs> Saturday the 17th little scrummers returns to to the club um unless other plans get in the way um but yeah no I think you've done an amazing job with the girls section. It's well, been really thank you for saying so. Hopefully we'll uh, we'll catch you on another episode of the podcast in the future. Uh, I've got a couple of ideas that I think we're going to start bouncing around. Um, obviously, we work very closely with uh, with an Irishman as well. Um, so whether we get him on here and tempt fate, I'm not 100 percent too sure. But you know, it's it has been it's been a, an interesting insight into the girls' section, and obviously you've done an incredible I'd, I'd job. Test his bladder strength, see if he can last the hour. First. <laughs> you might have yeah. to wander off halfway through. <laughs> Man of his age. Well, yeah, that is that, that is true. He is the oldest coach, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's it's been a pleasure. Um, He's got the least hair. What's that? He's got the least hair of all coaches. Well, yeah. No, that is true. He does shave off. but no. It's um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, I know that we'll catch up with you soon. Um, Indeed. Possibly, Live long and prosper. Possibly at another JS coaching uh, quiz night. Ooh. Number two is in the planning work, so Ooh. keep your eyes peeled out for that. Uh, I will peel my eyes specially. Perfect. Only after I finish peeling the carrot. <laughs> awesome. Right. Thanks very much, Simon. I'll catch up with you soon.